So my talk is basically about what you might call European or Western style astronomy, but it's not really quite the same area that the conference is about. But it gives you some kind of context about what's going on in South Africa and about this place where you are now. So this is a picture from a 19th century book showing how it was to arrive in Cape Town in the days of sail. And of course, the unique features of the southern sky, the, the southern cross up here, and uh, Alpha and Vita Centaurus here, and the Magellanic Clouds. Of course, they were something quite extraordinary. You couldn't see those from the Northern Hemisphere at all. And Table Mountain is here. We are sort of situated over here at the moment. This is called Devil's Peak. That's Table Mountain. And this is the lion. And the lion's rump is Signal Hill, where they used to watch out for ships coming into the cave area. So I first start with a very brief outline of South African history. But uh, this area was occupied by tribal people called the Khoisan. And that's what, in the past, they referred they were the people called Hottentots and Bushmen in the old days. And that population partly wiped out by disease and conquest, and partly has formed part of what's called the colored population in Cape Town today. Uh, and then the remainder of what's now South Africa was occupied by Bantu peoples. And some of the Bantu peoples interacted, obviously, with Khoisan because some of the Bantu languages have clicks in them. And that's a characteristic of the language that the Khoisan people spoke. But in 1652, the Cape was colonized by the Dutch East India Company. And even though Dutch ships have been going by for 50 years or so, uh, it was only then that they decided to make a colony. And that was mainly to get refreshments for their ships on the long voyage to the East Indies, which was where they were making all their profits. So they needed fresh water, and they were able to bargain with the local people for the supply of cattle and sheep. And uh, so they stayed in charge of the Cape area and until about the end of the 18th century. Then there was this, the company fell apart around about then, and uh, the British took over for a few years, then left again, and came back a few years later. So from 1806 till 1910, the Cape area was actually a colony of, of Britain. And, uh, but at the same time, during the 19th century, quite a lot of settlers and other people went inland and gradually took over the whole country sometimes peacefully, sometimes with very severe wars and so on. So that four, three other colonies and, and republics were founded during the 19th century. Of course, there was a very bitter war. Because the camera uh, There was a very bitter war around about 1900, which eventually resulted in the Union of South Africa in 1910. And and that, that carried on, that was basically the white minority rule period, and very conservative and uh, unprogressive, until in, in 1961, they got, um, they were so out of favor with the rest of the world that they formed a republic and left the British Commonwealth. But by 1994, political scene had changed completely, and we had the first all-race elections and the election of the present ANC government. So that's a very unsubtle description of South African history. Uh, so basically what I'm talking about is uh, the development of scientific astronomy in South Africa, what's now South Africa. And it started off with some expeditions, and then we got permanent observatories. And these ex the first uh, few people who came, Guy Tachard, uh, in more detail just now, a French uh, Jesuit astronomer, Peter Colby, a German from the Berlin area, and then the most important of this group was Nicolas Louis de Lacaille, who came about 1751, and he did a lot of scientific astronomy and was a very one of the leading observers of his time. And then Mason and Dixon, who were known in the United States for having to find more or less the boundary between the north and the south. Uh, they, they actually were surveyors and they spent some time here 
and uh, came originally to uh, to the observation of the transit of Venus. Transits of Venus were a means of determining the distance scale of, of the uh, solar system. Anyway, this is uh, Tashar. Uh, he was on his way to to Siam for a uh, for an embassy from Louis XIV to King Siam. And he had just came here for a very short time, just over a week. And he set up a little observatory uh, on the east side of the company gardens. Now, you, if you go to the museum and the planetarium, you will actually see the company gardens. And uh, the area where his observatory was, we think, is probably where the presidential uh, mansion is now. And he determined the longitude of the area by means of Jupiter's moons. If you by that stage, the eclipses of Jupiter's moons were very well tabulated, so it was possible to predict them quite successfully. So using that as a clock, we could work out the time at Greenwich when you were sitting in South Africa, or the time in Paris or wherever. In fact, they often make, make worked out longitudes from uh, the Canary Islands of Hierro. That was the typical uh, point zero for some of the early astronomers. Now this chap, Peter Colby, came a little bit later. He was actually sent to get the solar parallax, in other words, the distance of the sun using trigonometry, using the Earth as a baseline between Berlin and Cape Town, and to, uh, to work out uh, the distances of other planets using tri trigonometrical means, and also to observe uh, well, the longitude by means of Jupiter's moons again. And he actually got quite a good value for the longitude, so he was quite a lot more expert. But strangely enough, he got a very bad write-up in history that uh, people like Lacai said, when he came here, he heard that Colby had done nothing but smoke and drink the whole time he was here. But I think partly Colby's problem was that he got involved in local politics. And there were some uh, very nasty uh, accusations of jobbery and corruption, um, and he kind of supported the, the people who are complaining to that East India Company about the behavior of their employees. So I think that's why people didn't like him. But I discovered quite recently that quite a lot of original material to do with him exists in the Paris Observatory Library, and um, I'm hoping someday to be able to go and examine it. Unfortunately, it's, it's in Latin, French and German, and it's the old kind of German writing that's very difficult to read. So we now come to Lakai. He was, uh, uh, he, he attended, his family wanted him to become a priest, but uh, he rebelled from that. He actually never became more than a deacon, but he always went around in clerical garb, at least uh, for his official portraits and so on. But he came here. Uh, already quite a well-known astronomer. He was a professor at one of the colleges in Paris. Paris in those days had a lot of colleges like uh, the old English universities had. And he established an observatory in Cape Town. He was a very persuasive talker, so he managed to persuade the Dutch governor at the time to finance the whole thing and gave him laborers and so on to build the observatory. And he brought a number of instruments with him and he used these to survey about 10,000 stars in the southern sky. And he also measured, did some geodetic measurements. He tried to work out the radius of the Earth uh, as, as it was, as it appeared from South Africa. And he, made, he measured the baseline extending over about one degree of, of latitude. And he came to a rather strange conclusion that the Earth is slightly pear-shaped. Um, and actually, there was nothing really wrong with his measurements, but what they hadn't realized was that his, his instruments were affected by the presence of mountains at each end of his baseline, so that his pendulums, instead of pointing down to the center of the Earth, were pulled slightly outwards like that. So he got his measurements of latitude were slightly off, although his measurements of the distance between his, his stations was very accurate, and it was verified several times later. So that was the geodesic survey part. He also measured the distance to the sun. Uh, 
And on the left, you see this the book, the, the Southern Starry Sky, observed for the construction of a catalogue of, of uh, stars. We have a copy of this catalogue here. And in fact, we have all the proceedings of the French Academy from, from the very beginning as well in our library. And uh, on the right, I don't think it's <coughs> but here, this is approximately the site of his observatory. This was the shoreline of Cape Town. And uh, these houses basically face Strand Street, which is now one of the main streets in the center of town. But all this area has been filled in since then, and the shoreline brought out quite a bit. This was the headquarters of the Dutch East India Company, all the workshops and so on. But this is what his observatory must have looked like. We, we have a floor plan of it, and this is my reconstruction of the observatory. He had three basic instruments, and usually they were mounted on the north-south line. He had a clock, and uh, the bed and the desk, and the roof had little, little openings like that in it, so that he wasn't disturbed too much by the wind. So every night that he possibly could, <coughs> he was there all night, and then spent the next day reducing his data, sleeping for about three hours, and then taking a walk, and then back to work again. He didn't have any assistance, he just had a little dog with him. So Mason and Dixon came for the 1761 uh, transit of Venus, and uh, it, they had a reason to be a success. I think they were the only people uh, in the Southern Hemisphere who, who managed to observe it. And they also made observations of latitude and longitude to verify what people had said in the past. And I just put this in, but uh, but the view of various attempts to derive the longitude, and you see they're very uh, scattered at first, but by Colby's time, he more or less got the right answer. And uh, you, you look at it, given that he was a few, a few seconds of time away at longitude, he was pretty close to the right answer. And Lankai, of course, was a very precise worker. So uh, it's, he was basically 14 seconds away so if you, if you make that correction, you see he more or less got the great answer. And of course, once in the 19th century, you started to have chronometers, and, uh, and then with twin telegraphs became available, you could do a pretty accurate determination of the local time. So this is a picture of what the cape was like in uh, 1831. And you see, even then, the interior of the country wasn't very well explored. So Cape Town was here, and uh, when you went north of the frontier, it just said inhabited by Bushmen, race, or Hottentots. And here they called it Kaffir land. In those days, Kaffir is, is nowadays, I should say, a very dirty word, uh, but, but it meant then it originally came from an Arabic word meaning people who, who were heathens. And uh, when people in the Cape were talking about the black population, they called them Kaffirs. It wasn't really a pejorative term in those days, but it has become one now. And you see it says up here, Zulus. That would have been the Zulu tribes of those days. And this is approximately where Maputo is. You see the Maputo River. That's, so the north boundary of South Africa is kind of across here. So this part of the interior wasn't known at all. <coughs> time of the observatory was started here. So this is the place where we are now. It's the first permanent observatory. I think it's probably the oldest scientific institution in Africa, let alone uh, south, south of the Sahara, as you just said. Uh, but uh, you, you see the site. Well, the, the central building was finished in 1828. And some of the other buildings date from quite a few dates from the 19th century. And this is one of, the, one of the earliest pictures ever taken in South Africa. Probably the earliest picture of an observatory, apart maybe from Herschel's telescope. Um, but Piazzi Smith, who was the sort of chief assistant here at that time, uh, built his own cameras and photographic materials and took a series of pictures. And just before him, uh, somebody called Thomas Henderson uh, 
got a clue that uh, there was something curious about the star Alpha Centauri, that it had high proper motion. In other words, it was moving quite noticeably <coughs> across the sky. On a, on a, it's noticeably on an astronomical scale, I should say, very small in real terms. But he observed it systematically, and he was able to measure its distance, because he found it had what we call a parallax of, of an arc second. In other words, if you measured it from one side of the Earth's orbit and the other side of the Earth's orbit, he found that it moved compared to the distant stars. So that told you that it was actually quite near to us by the standards. Unfortunately for him, he didn't have much confidence in his results. He didn't publish till after Bessel had published the results in the northern hemisphere from Königsberg uh, on a star called 61 Sigmi. So Bessel got both the glory, but, uh, but Henderson got these got a little bit. And there were quite a number of, of Her Majesty's astronomers, as they're called. And David Gill was the most active of these. And he was basically the pioneer of doing sky cataloging by photography. So. Uh, the Cape Photographic Tour of Mustard was the first big catalog produced by photographic means. And many of the little buildings that are here now were built during his regime. <coughs> so, as the 20th century wore on, uh, quite a number of observatories were founded. Uh, the Transvaal or Union or Republic Observatory changed its name according to the political status of where it was in Johannesburg. Uh, they had a number of, of, um, of telescopes, something went wrong there, I think one would change the computer. Um, but it, it ended up with a 26 inch visual refractor and it also housed an observatory for the Leiden Observatory from 1938. So quite a number of famous people worked there like Hertzsprung and so on. I should say that Gill attracted a lot of foreign workers to come and work here as well. But um, the important thing about the Transvaal Observatory was they, they actually discovered what is still the nearest star. It's called Proxima Centauri. And it's very close to Alpha Centauri. And it may even be bound to it, we don't know that for sure. But people have tried very hard to find their stars ever since. And uh, so far, nobody's managed to find one. Closer. Of course, if there is anything closer, it would have to be a very obscure, uh, probably just a, a very cool, cool star that has very low luminosity. Then the Yale Observatory came in. They wanted to do measurements of the distances of southern stars. And they built an observatory in Johannesburg. I think the building is still there, but it's used for other things. The Montassi Observatory in Michigan, they built a uh, that was actually in Bloemfontein, and it's, it's in use today at the planetarium, I think. And Boyd Observatory, Mazensport, that was started by Harvard. They had originally got an observatory in Peru, but they moved it to South Africa, partly because it was easier to get here, but partly because the weather was terrible. They built their observatory on a mountain called El Misti in Peru. You can imagine what happened. Um, then the Radcliffe Observatory, Originally it was in Oxford in England, but they realized that they wanted to do good modern work. They'd have to go to somewhere where the climate was more suitable. So uh, the people in charge of it at that stage got the money together to build an observatory in Pretoria. So strangely enough, it was opposed by people in Oxford. Oxford is known for lost causes and so on. But the, 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 uh, it was, but they managed to get Einstein to testify favor of the observatory of the university. Unfortunately, they, he was trumped by other evidence. And uh, so just to give you some idea, the total astronomers in South Africa around 1950 probably only 12. Probably the other people working for observatory technicians and maintenance people would probably only be another 20 or so. So it's a very small community there. You probably now have more than 100 astronomers here and support people and so on. When you add in the square kilometer of red people, there probably must be around about 300 other people working in engineering and support of observatories. <coughs> so this is a picture of the 
of the country as it exists now, so that the Cape Colony more or less ended around like this in the, in the, that earlier map. And uh, we are now still down here, and Johannesburg is up there, which is more or less the economic capital of the country. So I'll just show you where the observatories are. The Union Observatory is there, and then the Boyden Observatory. Radcliffe Observatory. Now, Radcliffe Observatory was eventually closed down because uh, the Radcliffe Foundation was a private foundation. They had very little money. And also, the site in Victoria wasn't so good anymore. They're getting a lot of uh, pollution from the steel refineries and also from the lights, just the, sky, the light, city lights and so on. So, the telescope was bought by the CSIR and moved to, to Sutherland in 19. Well, the Southern was started, officially opened in 19, started around 1972, and uh, the telescope was moved out around 1976. So this is now the present day South African Astronomical Observatory, and we are the headquarters campus of that observatory. So it combined the Royal Observatory Cape with the Republic Observatory in Johannesburg. In the beginning, it was partly financed from the UK because they had a lot of obligations for people's pensions and things like that. And uh, the UK uh, continued to uh, finance about a third of the budget for about 15 years after the observatory started. And our Sutherland station, uh, which was started about 400 kilometers away, as Patricia said, uh, it was put there because it, it had very clear night skies, very dark as well. So we could once again look at the very faint objects in the sky without light pollution. And the observatory was actually started, one of the people who opened it was Margaret Thatcher, um, Chief Minister of Science in the UK at that stage. And now, uh, originally, it was uh, financed in South Africa by the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, the CSIR. And that part of the CSIR was taken over by the National Research Foundation. So nearly all the pure science that used to be done as part of the national organization has become part of the National Research Foundation. <coughs> and this is a picture of our site at Sutherland. Uh, it shows the Solomon telescope, which dates from the big telescope at the left. That dates from, uh, it was finished in about 2000. And it uh, was well, started in 2000, inaugurated in 2005, and it took some time to get it sorted out, but it's running very well now. And that, that tin can shaped observatory is the one that came from Pretoria. And then all these other domes have been added over the years. Um, some of them are local ownership, some of them from foreign ownership. A lot of sky survey work is done from here, monitoring of the sky for changes. For example, where um, they look for things like asteroids, uh, stars that are novas, supernovas and galaxies. And so there's a lot of, it's, it's a sort of reflection of the computer age that you can monitor the whole sky and very quickly pick out things that have changed and then look to see what the long-term pattern is. And of course, as soon as you see something interesting, they notify the telescopes to uh, follow up on their observations. And this is just a picture of the telescope of the snow. We get quite a lot of snow in Sutherland. And uh, it's been about minus 12 there the last few days. And that telescope has a collecting area of about 11 meters diameter. And it has it's a segmented big primary mirror with 91 hexagonal segments each, about a meter across. So it's quite international. It's partly a copy of a design in Texas. The glass for the mirrors was made in Russia. The figuring was done in the United States. The realizing we did ourselves. And it's basically an imaging and spectroscopy telescope, primarily for spectroscopy. As Patricia said, we have partners from all over, national partners from some countries and individual institutions from others. So there are several American universities, for example, national thing from Poland, uh, New Zealand, and then from um, India has some some participation from UK and, uh, and, well, institutions in the UK as well. 
So we have about 35% uh, of the time, or something of that order. So the time has to be given out, you know, equal. it's quite a tricky business because everybody wants dark time and, uh, and so on and so forth. So you have to make sure everybody essentially gets their share or persuade them they're getting a bit more than they deserve. And this is just to show you where the radio astronomy observations are. So, so the original radio astronomy observatory is called HARTRAU nowadays. It stands for Harsha Beast Radio Astronomy Observatory. And that was originally a, a NASA tracking station. But it, as time went on, NASA lead, had less need for tracking stations spaced around the world. Because, of course, they could send data to satellites and then download it to the United States. And now, the new site for radio telescopes is in the Karoo region, a very remote area. It's about six hours driving from here, quite rough roads. And there's something called the CAT Karoo Array Telescope. That is, has already been constructed. It has seven antennas, uh, about of the order of 12 to 15 meters diameter. And the next stage is called Meerkat. That's a kind of a play on things because Mere cats are animals, but mere means more as well. So uh, that's now under construction. Uh, this is the picture of the old observatory in Hoshbeach Hook. It's still very active. It takes part in the uh, international BLBI, very long baseline interferometry, which is used to get the details of very, very tiny sources in the sky. For example, the d details of, uh, of quasars radio sources around them. But they also do a lot of geodetic work. They can measure their positions within like centimeters and measure uh, continental drift and that sort of thing. Movements of the Earth's pole, of course, the Earth is, is a lot of very subtle movements. It's not just spinning simply every 24 hours. It's, it's got some very complicated movements. And of course, the harder you look, the more of these you find. And the Earth wobbles, and there's all sorts of curious things if you look hard enough. And this is the, the meerkat. Uh, at the top one is the cat observatory, which is complete now. And, uh, it's, and then there's the meerkat. We only have one antenna finished, as far as I know. And that was the inauguration a few months ago. And then there's a very interesting uh, international project called PAPER, uh, which is probing the, the uh, early, early stages of the universe. And it's a kind of a first attempt to pick up things at very high redshift that originated when the universe was very young. So it's it's one of her, it's going to become a much bigger project in, in due course, but this is a kind of pathfinder for a very huge <coughs> Now the square kilometer array, the details of that are still being decided. South Africa's got quite a chunk of it, but some of it will go in Australia. It'll be a separate set of antennas for different wavelength regions. And the exact details of the layout of the antennas and what kind of antennas we use have still to be determined. And, oh yes, the last slide is an international project. Um, it should say Cherenkov Telescope. Uh, with a little funny accent on the scene. Um, but uh, this is a, a very, very interesting project, uh, a very successful one mainly led by uh, German institutions. HESS was a famous German company, Rebus, that's what this stands for, High Energy Stereoscopic System. And it detects gamma rays through their interaction with the Earth's atmosphere. And the, re recently, this extra large telescope has just been constructed and added to the existing uh, uh, set of antennas. And there's a, there's a movement to have an even larger uh, gamma ray telescope and South Africa is bidding for it, whether it gets it or not. Know. So that's a summary of more or less uh, astronomy is carried on now in South Africa. So. Expedition to Cyprus 
navigate Africa. Are there any remains in South Africa from this expedition? Might you know? I don't believe so. I think the oldest remains we have are some of the Portuguese expeditions around uh, 1490. Recent times. Yeah, that's recent. Yeah, there are many. I mean, I'm not too sure how reliable these sort of accounts of Phoenicians and the, but also the you know this famous Chinese uh, Admiral from the 1420 supposed to have also done all sorts of strange things like this. But there's no evidence I know of to support what they're having been here. But when you think about it, I mean, weather, erosion, and everything make a lot of changes in the space of 2,000 years. I think that they found artifacts, you know, Roman coins and things. I know as far south as Tanzania. I, I've heard rumor of Mozambique as well, but I haven't heard so far. There were probably slave traders in Roman times that would work their way down the coast as well. And trading animals as well. For the yes. Yeah, in fact, the first giraffe in Europe was at the time of Caesar. I'm not sure where they caught it, but nobody really believed they existed you know, for hundreds of years after, so they found them. 